Every Saturday morning, join us from 10 to 11 o'clock a.m. Eastern Daylight Time for the Astrology of Life live stream. It's 90 minutes of conversation with astrologers and with those folks that join us in chat talking about astrology, world events, personal transformation, and things that we can be looking forward to in the future. Every Sunday morning from 10 to 11 o'clock a.m. Eastern Daylight Time, join me and CJ as we discuss topics regarding spiritual awakening, meditation, astral travel, and the body of light. If you are wondering how to prepare yourself from the difficult times ahead, this is the live stream that you want to join and be a part of. The energy is wonderful, and the folks that are there are great people. Hope to see you there. For those of you that are not able to be with us on Saturday and Sunday mornings from 10 to 11 Eastern Daylight Time, we are now going to be doing two live streams in the evening from 7 to 8 p.m., one on Tuesday, the other on Thursday. The Tuesday evening live stream will be, in a sense, a shadow of the Saturday Astrology of Life live stream. It will be about astrology. And the Thursday live stream will be a shadow for the Knowing Whispers live stream that we have on Sunday. And it will deal with things such as meditation, astral travel, spiritual growth, spiritual awakening, and inner healing. So, if you can't make it on Saturday and Sunday, join us on Tuesday or Thursday evening. Thank you. Hello everybody, this is Robert Cosmar of the Astrology of Life YouTube channel. The Knowing Whispers YouTube channel, and also the Astrology Network on YouTube. Today, uh, you're in for a treat. Today, I am going to be uploading, you're going to be watching, if you're watching this video, an interview that I had with past Matrix Software CEO and President Michael Earlywine. Michael is an accomplished author, an accomplished astrologer, and also a uh, very good photographer. Uh, in this interview, we talk about many things regarding astrology, regarding uh, life experience, our perspective on um, really what the deeper meaning of astrology is. And I think that uh, you'll enjoy this very much. And uh, Michael's also put this up on his YouTube channel. If you want to go over there, you can watch it over there as well. But um, thanks for watching. And uh, if you get a chance to comment, please do comment, and we will begin the video now. Right up. Okay, we're recording right as as of right now. Okay? That's cool. So there's a lot, of, you know, um, there's a lot of areas that I know that you. I don't know whether you know. I know a lot about music. I know you do. I know a lot about nature. For some reason, for some reason, Michael, the thing about you. That intrigued me is that on some level I always suspected that there was a depth to you that is not always maybe revealed but that could be because of the fact that outside of your books and a few things I know about you I don't know you personally but in a sense I do know you from the way you write well yeah and the fact that it's not it's not what I have seen or experienced through most astrologers. Well, I'm not most astrologers. And I suspect it has to do with that very close conjunction to Neptune to your midheaven in your natal horoscope. Well, whatever. I mean, I think there's a lots of ways to look at it, right? Mm -hmm. um, my Neptune is conjunct uh, the midheaven, conjunct mm -hmm. the northern and northern moon pretty exactly. Exactly. And, and heliocentrically, it's conjunct uh, Venus. Correct. And part of a six six party trine, grand trine, with mm -hmm. six planets, which is really unusual. Um, it's not only that, but I found it I found it unusual, and I was going to ask you something about that. It had to have been challenging growing up, really establishing your identity because you had that 10th house neptune which had to have been a connectedness to higher states of consciousness that maybe you were or were not at the time aware of what was going on uh, i'm sure the music helped that out in the 60s but you have that earthy taurus stuff in the sixth house which of course helped you as a businessman 
Well, but so I'm, a, I'm an archivist. So help me out. I, I want to take care of and preserve stuff. Okay. That's, that's what the sixth house tells you. Okay. Um, to, to, to take care of, you know, I'm an archivist. That's what I mostly was. Yeah. Well, see, I, it, it makes sense to me. What you're saying makes sense when I consider the work you've done along the way, how you write. Yeah. As there is a transcendent quality to your writing, particularly astrologically, which really uh, excites me because of the fact that there's that depth there that sometimes a lot of the material that's out there doesn't get beyond just a mental observation and analytical perspective on astrology. It doesn't transcend into the consciousness of astrology. Well, there's no roots to it, to a lot of it. It's all intellectual. You know, I'm very rooted. I'm very, there's a lot of, lot of earth, mm -hmm. um, a lot of Taurus. Mm -hmm. uh, and stuff like that. So also, I'm just passing through, right? I'm an astrologer that's passing through, um, but I, I'm a, I'm a master astrologer that people just don't know it. That I I know a lot about astrology, but uh, most of my astrology isn't generally known. I mean, mm -hmm. even the stuff I've done, I, I can't I can't say that. In, in all the years I've done astrology, which is about 60, that I even have one student that, that can talk to me and ask questions that are reasonable, that show me they understand the stuff, right? I'll tell you what surprised me, and I never would have thought this through most of the 30-some years that I've been involved in, in astrology. I never would have thought that I would have reached a point where I recognized there was a point of transcendence beyond what is commonly identified with astrology. What's that? I mean, you got to paraphrase that a bit. I'm not sure I understand that. Okay. It's like when I do astrology readings or if I do um, live streams, like we just got off a live stream that we did for about an hour. There is a sense of being connected to a higher source energy within inside of myself. The work that I do in regards to clients, that same guidance is there with me. And there is that sense that when I'm going through the charts with people and stuff, that I'm looking for a way to connect with them so that the energy can be raised to a different level of their understanding or of their experience of what they're going through. Exactly. I understand that. I mean, there's a certain point usually reached where you can, it, it can uh, cause people to have to choke up or swallow, or there's actually little physical signs when you make this uh, change. There's a little change that comes when you're on another level. Um, they're all physical. I mean, you can, I'm aware of it. And, and of course, I'm aware of it when I'm doing a reading. Mm -hmm. Just because uh, you can just feel it. It's just like changing gears, right? You're going, right. Yeah. So I, I'm with you on that. And it's like, you can't do it for everybody. But it seems like that the more that you are committed to that inner relationship, the more people that are sent to you that are ready for that level of astrological reading or service or connection maybe something like that maybe i don't know that um i mean yeah definitely through your reputation and what you do it's a filter and the ones that are more interested in what you are get to you right mm -hmm. but i'm not sure how magical that is but i just don't know mm -hmm. that works so do you believe in magic michael my father was a a well-known magician of the other kind so i grew up hating hating that because i was dragged around to meet all the famous magi magicians and endlessly endlessly but do i believe in magic um i don't know what you really mean by magic i mean certainly uh, i mean i'll give you i'll give you i'll give you yeah, a, some do. territory some territory okay okay do, good, you, good. do you feel do you feel that the world as it is and the way we are is in direct relationship to our disempowerment from our higher nature. In other words, we have created the world as it is because of who we are, because we, for whatever reason, chose not to be 
whole? I don't know. So let's talk about that. This is, this is an interesting point. Buddhism mm -hmm. is not Platonism. Uh, mm -hmm. Let's talk, talk about, or it's not Christianity, uh, which means that both Plato and Christians believe that we believe in original sin. Mm -hmm. That once we once we we're whole or pure, but we fell away from it, and we need to come back. That's not right. what Buddhists believe. But Buddhists don't believe that at all. Mm -hmm. They believe we in all the time there is, and perhaps all the lifetimes each of us have had supposedly uh we never knew we've never we never knew it's not like we knew and forgot we're mm -hmm. trying to get back we never got there and this was very clear because i asked my teacher who was a very high lama but i worked with for 36 years this a number of times in a number of ways because it meant a lot to me to try to to, to know is, is am i trying to get back to what i was or did I have I never gotten there? And he was very, very clear. You never got there. He called us, we're the stragglers, the ones in, in all the times there is never got it, un, been unable to get it. Not that we got it and lost it and somebody's got to help us. So that's a huge difference. Mm -hmm. you know, if you follow me. So mm -hmm. which one are you? Hmm. Well, you know, what's interesting. Um, I feel like that I at least here recently anyhow have come i'm at the verge i'll put it to you this way i astral travel almost daily what's that I'm, mean for me what it means is that i'm able to shut off a good part of my mental and emotional attachment and i'm able to feel on a much deeper level of my inner being, my third eye gets activated. I'm able to see and interact, um, what I would call interdimensionally, with different levels of consciousness. Um, and it continues. It can. It keeps growing. It keeps getting stronger. It's. It's Michael. It's like I've learned the process of separating the identity through the ego, the mind, and the emotions and have begun to develop a relationship with a higher, finer feeling nature with inside of myself. Okay. And that that energy, that energy is what is working through me in the videos that I do and also in the uh, individuals that I do readings for. Um, <clears throat> and going back to what you said there about, you know, where are you on the path? Um, I identify that as that we are being called to what I use the term. We are being called to wholeness and a recognition of the totality of who and what we are. And that okay. that's the path, that's the path we have been on. Okay. But it seems like that right now with the things that are happening in the world and the urgency of what's involved, that things have speeded up, you know, Pluto in, going into the latter part of Capricorn and stuff, things are, are, are accelerating, you know, with Neptune, the madness and everything, uh, the dissolving of the old structures and stuff. It's like there's a combination there of the Pluto or the Neptunian energy wanting to rise us higher in our awareness while the physical structure starts to shake and crumble. But where is it going? What's so it's an ex ex exponential curve is what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. And I was having a talk, uh, oftentimes uh, I've done videos with John Townley and John and I have oh. talked back and forth about this. And he and I are good friends. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I found, we were talking about astrology and the fixation on just the, what I call the mechanical mental, you know, analysis right. of it, you know. And I, I said to John, I said, John, I said, if that's all we're doing with astrology, what good is it? Where is it leading us? Where is it trying to show us? Really? And you know? what do you find? What, you, what, what, what do you see? Exactly. It's like, what is it? I mean, it's almost like, I mean, that's like I said, that's why I was excited to be able to talk to you because in your writings, I said, this man has vision. Sometimes. This man, <laughs> yeah, right. He may astral travel. He may be aware on a deeper level than what 
uh, many of the astrologers that I've read their books over the years and stuff, you know, he definitely is not the standard astrologer that is put out there as, you know, uh, this is right. an astrologer, you know. Uh, you don't you don't get an award for that. That that's pretty clear, right? <laughs> so so you know, yeah, I'm not a standard astrologer. Yeah. But my hope, here's my hope. My hope is that for the folks that see this interview with you, not just learn about you, but they also are able to taste some of the energy that comes about as a result of our sharing back and forth, our particular experiences and insights. That'd be good. I'm I'm, I'm for that. Right. Yeah. To feed them, something to feed them, something to nourish and feed us, you know, because it's so rare sometimes to be able to talk astrologically to what would be considered to be beyond just the basic foundational structure, you know, uh, and, and talk well, about these. Yeah, but uh, astrologers, in my opinion, I don't know how to put it. I could say they're in deep shit. Um, <laughs> they've been wandering for about 500 years uh, and haven't come out of it yet. Uh, and I've met thousands of astrologers and as customers, I've had 30 or 40,000 customers over the years, not that I knew all of them, uh, but many of the great astrologers of my generation like have been to my home and, and we've been able to talk like we're talking, people mm -hmm. like Roger and Gokulan and uh, Charles Harvey, and I could just go on down, you know, Robert Hand and John Tomley, of course. John, John and I are close friends. Um, anyway, so I know quite a bit about what is going on or was going on. I don't know. Today, I don't know what's going on in astrology. But I haven't found That's even of any, I haven't found anything. I, I see all the, uh, all of the folks looking into the different, ancient astrology in Greek and Latin and Arabic and all that stuff. I have no quarrel with that. I'm just not interested in that just because that's a lot of work. Uh, and I'm basically a lazy astrologer. I want the thing to work for me, not me work for it, if that makes any sense. I want this thing to work. And mm -hmm. the techniques that I've come up with mostly came out of my own mind. Uh, I've mixed my astrology with my uh, Tibetan Dharma mm -hmm. uh, pretty thoroughly. Uh, and I've learned to go, and I had probably the largest astrology library in the world, mm -hmm. uh, at my, and, which I donated to a University of Illinois some years ago. So I've had a chance to look at everything almost that's been ever written. Uh, it's just... Uh, there's very little clarity in all of that. Um, it, it's really sad. And also astrologers can't seem to make a decent living, right? They, they can't, they don't have enough money. Yeah. So they, they begrudge each other. Uh, yeah. It's like a bunch of people in the middle of the deep water trying to climb on each other to try to get out of the water. Um, and as, this sounds pretty negative. It's not negative. No. It's, a, it's, it's accurate. It's that, accurate. There's no, ever since Copernicus, mm -hmm. uh, astronomers got it, right? They, became, they, they walked away with two charts that they both use. Mm -hmm. We astrologers walked away with the one that we started with, which is the geo one, mm -hmm. geocentric positions, and, and we've never shown any interest. And we, so it's like saying, we think everything revolves around us. Mm -hmm. Because that's what Copernicus pointed out. He says, no, yeah, it's... Everything doesn't revolve around us because we revolve around the sun. Yeah. Uh, but no, we shook that off somehow. Somehow we were able to get along without that information. And I think that's that the empowerment that astronomers got, we've never taken as a group. I don't think that I don't think that people take not just astrologers, I don't think that people understand the depth of know thyself and how absolutely critical it is to not only their inner healing, but to the revelation of the great truth of life. Okay. I'm, I mean, I'm listening to that. I mean, know thyself, you're touching touchy stuff just because uh, the Buddhists don't, don't really recognize the self as, a, uh, as, as what's called like a soul. Right. That's going to live. 
the self, but what we call the self in, in Buddhist terminology, doesn't last beyond our, our grave and our death. We don't right. take it with us. We don't right. appear. Michael Earlywine is not going to appear in a rebirth. Mm -hmm. uh, but I am going to have a rebirth, apparently. But mm -hmm. it will be certain traces and certain, certain things within myself I've set in motion through my own desires and graspiness that, that are going to draw around themselves in another birth uh, a new personality. And mm -hmm. it's going to go by a different name. Mm -hmm. uh, because all of those traces and all of those uh, attachments that we have are going to continue on until they they wear themselves out. That idea. So um, when you took when you winning the word self in it, then I have to talk about what do you mean by that? Mm -hmm. uh, when you say know thyself, let me if let you me want to to say know thyself means know that there's there's no that the self is something. It's a construct according to Buddhists that we create as mm -hmm. kind of an assistant, somebody to help us out. But mm -hmm. we've kind of, it's like ventriloquist and a dummy, but we've kind of let the dummy direct us. That, that's kind of a Buddhist point of view. It's always, it's always the problem, <clears throat> Michael, that to convey truth, words never quite measure up to the actual experience. Well, that's by definition. Right. Now, because words, my, words, words have to make sense. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, right. it's nonsense, and and if you if if they don't make sense, then um, I mean the, the, another way to say this is that words, all language, are simply pointers toward sensual experience, toward actually going, you know, go forth and live it. Don't mm -hmm. talk about it. Mm -hmm. It's that kind of stuff. I mean, that's kind of a Buddhist perspective of uh, the conceptual mind, right? Trying. Which is most most astrologers are very conceptual, right? I mean, the truth is, most of them want to tell me about either one of two charts: either Hitler's chart, which I have no interest in, yeah, or the chart of the United States of America, which I have seen so many times and stuff that uh, there's got to be something else we could talk about besides Hitler's chart. You right. know what I'm saying? You got it exactly. Exactly. And of course, the USA charts debatable as to the actual accuracy of the whole thing. Everything's you know, so. debatable, apparently, according to Trumpism and stuff like that. I mean, everything's <laughs> look at the state we're in, right? Here's my here's my view. Here's my, my view upon what I was saying about the cell based upon my personal experience. Okay. Well, that's what you got, right? Exactly. All right. What I see, what I what I experience is that essentially there are, are at least, I'll use the terminology, there are two bodies. There's the physical body, then there's the spiritual or the astral body, and of course there's the etheric, there's other levels involved in that. But <clears throat> the physical body, okay, essentially is composed of the mind, the ego, the imagination, the emotional body, the memory, and things of that nature. Because our a fraction of our being, of our total nature, is focused in the physical dimension at that vibration through the physical body for the experiences that we are having in this world. But, and it's partially because of the fact that we have somehow shut down our feeling nature. We are thinking rational beings who have feelings, but they're so far suppressed that we're unable to experience the finer dimensional qualities of the universe. Of which we are. But have we, have we suppressed them or have we just never delved into them? Possibly. But it seems like in terms of the experiences that I've had because of the, the things that have been opened or the awakening going on is that there is this knowledge or this need to awaken our feelings and to realize that we never really have left home. We are just not looking at it. We're not looking far enough into ourselves to realize that we're still connected to the higher levels of the universe or whatever you want to call it, and that it is an infinite experience, okay? If we're willing to interact in that, that uh, matrix, if you want to call it that. But, but there's a lot of gotchas in there. Uh, I mean, I, I hear what you're saying, but I think that you're... Even as you speak, you're bringing layer upon layer of conceptual 
stuff to it. I'm not sure, sure mm -hmm. how far any of us can follow those layers mm -hmm. before it just gets opaque. I think um, that, it, you know, for me, Michael, it, it's, I can only base it upon the experience that I have on those journeys and the sense that I've that's true. separated, that I've separated from the mental and emotional body to a degree to where my identity is totally taking on a different texture completely. Almost, you know, an instantaneous type thing to where I know things before I can, can put words to them or I sense things, you know, symbolically a lot of times in terms of what I'm seeing and uh, seeing things about my own past unconscious, uh, you know, issues that I have carried through a good part of my life, uh, situations where I have felt and experienced a healing as a result of that. Um, and again, it goes back to this, this feeling that the purpose of all of this chaos is a reflection of what we identify with what's inside of ourselves and the greed and the fear are kind of maxing that out, but still on the inside, okay, below the emotional and mental trauma, there is this opportunity being given or this hand reaching down and saying that, you know, okay, you know, you're seeing this go on, but there is a way through this, but it's not through politics and it's not through uh, anybody's promises. It's through the process of reclaiming or reowning the totality of who we are as a spiritual, physical being. I mean, you know, again, I would just I would say we're not reclaiming. We never claimed it. We never okay. got there. Okay. And as far as reaching up, I don't think it's so much of reaching up as I do reaching within. There you go. Or reaching right. down yeah. in our own self. I don't. Right. I, let us don't believe in a. Uh, we're not theists, right? We don't believe there's somebody up there. We're, we're going to have to do it ourselves. Exactly. So that's, that's personal a, responsibility. Personal responsibility right. is absolutely essential because there isn't anybody that can sell it to you, except yourself. I mean, you you have to believe it and become certain on your own. Right. Anyway, where are we leading with this? Because I think we could go on talking this way <laughs> forever and still not get much right. of anywhere. Let's so. go back here. Let's go back to this is your life, Michael. Let's okay, call okay. it this is your life. Okay. <laughs> let's right. go. Let's go back to the 60s. As I recall, you were not only a musician, but you also were involved in either organizing, promoting some of the well-known musicians that came out of the 60s and uh, also were a part of... Uh, concerts possibly there in the Michigan area. Would you like to share some of your experiences or what that particular part of your life meant to you? I could try. Um, again, I'm not sure which, which of those things you touched on you want to hear about. I mean... Um, All right. You in the late, actually, go ahead. Yeah, in the late 1950s, um, when I was young, I was part of the, the what's called the folk revival, which started in the 40s, really, but really was kind of reaching a, its heyday in the late 50s and early 60s, before, before the whole um, alternative culture of the hippies and stuff, which started about 1965. But there's a period of time between the late 50s and the middle 1960s where a lot happened. Um, and as far as I did, I mean, one thing I did was know and travel and hitchhike with Bob Dylan um, around the country and hang out. And he wasn't famous, but he was, he was already Bob Dylan. He wasn't Zimmerman. Um, so, but he's, he was a very bright guy, uh, but no brighter than any of us, as far as we know. I mean, it's just, he was, he was very ambitious, mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and I think he must have known. I remember one time when we were in New York City, and we were at, uh, trying, to, trying to remember what the name of the club was. Uh, I think it was Ger Gertie's Folk City. Mm -hmm. And there was a guy uh, who was later, I think, in the uh, 
I forget in what group, but maybe the Blues Project or something of that, a guy named Danny Kalb, who was a guitar player. And he was having kind of his time of life right then. He was very popular. And I remember sitting on the shadows at, back in the shadowy part with, with Dylan. Dylan, did, Dylan didn't like that. I mean, he didn't, he wasn't jealous. He just must have known who he was at some yeah. level. Even if he didn't know who he was, he was ambitious enough that, he, yeah, he was aware that he was not being uh, realized, right? He was not being recognized, mm -hmm. uh, that kind of thing. So I did a lot, of, a lot of hitchhiking for a number of years, many, many times to New York City or to the West Coast, not, not many times to the West Coast, but uh, a number of times to the West Coast. Um, so there's that part of me. Um, mm -hmm. Then, and I was never a very good musician during that part. I was trying to learn to do what's called Travis picking, which is a, a, also called three finger picking. Um, and I traveled with a guy called Perry Letterman, who, who Dylan and I would agree was probably the greatest Travis style picker we'd ever seen. He, he didn't sing, which is a good thing, uh, because he wasn't a great singer. But he was an incredible player. And when he would play a tune, it would have an opening and uh, a middle. It would have a, it was like an opera. Uh, it was incredible. And he would know it and I would know it. Um, so I traveled with him for quite a while. Uh, so there, there, there's that whole part of it. But maybe you want to hear more le uh, later when, uh, at some point in folk music, what we were all doing, Dylan wasn't writing his own songs then. If he did, he wasn't singing them. Uh, it wasn't about that. But the folk revival was just what the words say. It was like trying to take original folk melodies and trace them back to the most perfect original version of it you could possibly find. And that if somebody liked your work, it was they liked your work about being true to that music that came from England or Scotland or wherever. It was before any of us thought much about, oh, well, that we could write music, right? That we could be part of that. So that, that could be a whole story, which I won't bother with here, but I'm saying in, the, in that process, they also begin to take to the Newport Folk Festival and the different places like that, um, various country blues artists. And, so, so being a good revivalist of, of music, we wanted to go to the, take these blues players and try to trace them back and try to, um, to revive them. And then somewhere along in there, uh, we realized that, that the blues wasn't gone. It didn't need revival. In fact, it was just quite alive. It was just playing uh, on another side of town. Uh, maybe separated by a, what we would call a racial curtain. We didn't go to, to, to the, the black side, to the black bars and stuff, just because it was uncomfortable. Uh, and we weren't welcome and we didn't know how to be welcomed. So we began to, and, but this music didn't need to be revived, didn't need to be saved. It needed to be savored, right? We needed to appreciate it and we began to appreciate it. And that took up from there, from the time that I realized that, for many, many years, that's all that I studied. I studied black music and black musicians, and particularly blues musicians, maybe some jazz, but mostly all blues. And I, I in, interviewed, just like you're interviewing me, I interviewed um, scores and scores of them, not just the musicians, but their families and all this kind of stuff, um, with audio and eventually video. Um, a lot of it was lost by the University of Michigan, which is the horrible truth. Uh, but I got to know these people, and I got to know these people as um, not just musicians, but as, and then I have to take a quick sidebar. My father never really talked to, he had five boys. I was the oldest. He never really talked on a very personal level. I don't know about the rest of the boys. I don't think so. But for me, we never had a conversation about anything important. Uh, right. And that, that was... And neither did I have a grandfather on either side. So mm -hmm. I never had a male figure 
mm-hmm. that I could look up to on the inner sense, right. talking about stuff. So when I met these black, great black musicians like Muddy Waters and uh, Big Boy Crudup and just dozens and dozens of them, um, it wasn't just the music that interests me. It was that they fulfilled that within me of looking for a, a, an older male figure that had life wisdom mm-hmm. and that was willing to share it with me. Mm-hmm. And uh, that was a tremendous thing for me, just for the reason I gave you, if not for the, the wonderful music. And so I helped to put on two, two landmark festivals and later ones also. I was on a board of different mu- music organizations that presented the blues. In 1969, it was the first Ann Arbor Blues Festival ever. And there were scores and scores of musicians in one place. Maybe in their lives, they had been at a club together, two or three of them in passing or playing together, but they'd never been there by the hundreds and families. And so they'd never been together, much less being paid to do that and present themselves to to a, a white audience that was just beginning um, to understand and, and to love that music. So mm-hmm. I'm saying that was a, this was, this was just before Woodstock, mm-hmm. which I never went to because I was still in the throes of this, that's what I'm talking to you about. It just had happened a, a couple of weeks earlier. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, many of these musicians came to Ann Arbor to perform, but they showed up randomly kind of, as much as a week before. They just showed up and the University of Michigan put them up in, in uh, quad rooms, little tiny rooms or in bigger rooms. And we had, uh, we would just go like, um, go and see Big Mama Thornton, you know, Hound Dog. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we would just spend an evening probably drinking whiskey uh, with them until late at night or Big Boy Crew who wrote Elvis's first song, That's All Right, Mama. And we would just show up. My brother would just have, have we, he would just open the Big Boy Crew up was a huge man, big like Howling Wolf. Mm-hmm. He opened the door and Dan just showed him we had a bottle of Jack Daniels. And he mm-hmm. just said, come on in, boys. And we would spend hours talking to this. So, so I'm trying to give you a flavor that that's how we spent our time. And to, to, to me, it was, uh, was incredible. A very soul-feeding time, I'm sure. That's what it was. So uh-huh. that's just one part. Of, t- tell me, I think you should ask me questions about the other part of the music and stuff if you, that I'm not thinking you might want to hear about. I mean, I also played I with think, people, yeah, like Jerry wow. Garcia and stuff like that. Yeah. Well, any of those things, I think, would be of interest, you know, and I... I'm, um, you know, I don't know how you how you feel about things at the moment, but maybe you know if you are interested, um, we should should maybe consider having more conversations about different things or you know yeah. things of this nature. Because I'd love to be able to share this part of your experience and your journey with others on my YouTube channel and yeah. you know for people in general, you know. No, I'm happy to do that. I'm retired. I don't do anything but what I want to do. And uh, I'm busy all the time, but nothing interests me more than sharing some of this stuff because uh, I think not everyone knows about those periods in time. Right. Well, I think it's, like I said, I think what we were talking about when we started the discussion here, there's so much that astrology still needs. It's like a, it's like a corpse that needs revived, really. And and, Revived, maybe, but again, there's that same theme. Uh, of uh, of the idea of, of, of trying to get back to where we to a better state. I I don't think that's where we're going. I think we're trying to get to a better state. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, but but yeah, revive like the music. Yes, of course, mm-hmm. I, I get that. What about so, Jimi Hendrix? Did you meet Jimi Hendrix? I never met Jimi Hendrix. I loved his music, and certainly I knew some of the people that were impressed by his music. J- Jimi. Jimi Hendrix was a, a musician of another order of yes. magnitude. I'm going to have to get a dog here. That's <laughs> <laughs> okay. I come love here. dogs. You can come over here with me, Toby. Say hello to Michael, Tobe. <laughs> Listen up, Tobe. We're going to talk. 
So anyway, yeah, so anyway, Jimi Hendrix came along and he was like, what's, if you understand what an order of magnitude is, it, it, it's way yeah. greater than, than not. And his music was so profound uh, that people like Jimi Hendrix, I mean, uh, Eric Clapton and many, many others just about threw in the towel and just wanted to go home and take their marbles and quit because there's no oh. way that they could compete with him, nor did they ever compete with him. The truth of that energy that he channeled yeah. was so pure and so real that it immediately humbled them. Well, they should about. have. Been. Yeah. yeah. And, and in some cases, they've said it kind of destroyed some of them. It yeah, them well, that's, there you go. They, they, you know, I mean, I, I played it on the same stage with Clapton. I, mean, I opened for him for Cream mm -hmm. in the Fillmore Auditorium in 1967 in San Francisco. Watched him shoot up speed in the back room with, with Ginger Baker and, and uh, I forget the bass player's name, but. Uh, Jack Bruce. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. So. I was up around that, you know, I played on the same stage with Jerry Garcia, jammed with him and uh, stuff like that. So I was, I, I was kind of like a Forrest Gump in a sense. I was on the edge of a whole lot of pretty hot stuff. Yeah. Uh, but, but, you know, wasn't really in the center of it much. And that's okay. I think I'd be dead if I were. <laughs> um, you know, like, I mean, I spent an evening with... Uh, Janis Joplin just drinking whiskey and stuff like that. So I got to meet these guys and gals. Um, now, now I lost my track of train of thought. So okay, I think that you know, I think that I guess maybe this comes with age. You know, Michael, when you look at your life and you you think of all the things you imagined you were going to accomplish and you realized that you didn't, that somewhere you have to in your life you have to come to an acceptance that. And I'll use the term here, karma, fate, and destiny, that you have to come to terms with the fact that whether it's your karma, your fate, or your destiny, this is who you are. This is what you're designed to do. This is the reason why you're here, and that's okay. It, um, no, but I, I feel that I've done almost all the things I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. I mean, just not to argue with you, but sure. to, con to contrast with you that most, I'm a good finisher. You know, mm -hmm. that I, I don't just start things, I finish them. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, like all music guide, even today, it's the largest music database in the world, mm -hmm. period. Mm -hmm. Everything, every record from 10 inch records on up, I, and I don't own the company anymore, but I started it, nor are they covering it like it did. But we, I had 150 full time employees mm -hmm. and 500 to 700 freelance writers that worked with our company uh, to cover all this music. And I did the same thing for a film. I, I created one of the two largest film databases in the world. And I could go on and, and the largest poster database of rock mm -hmm. and roll concert posters, not just the kind of stupid posters, but the ones that actually represented a, uh, a physical concert that you could go to and that, you know got torn down and taken home. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying that I did, didn't just do these, I finished them, right? Mm -hmm. I, mean, they're un, I mean, it's unfinished forever just because there's no music every day. But I'm saying that I don't have a lot of misgivings of that kind of anything else I wanted to do that I can think of. I'm sure there was some I'd like to, I, would, I think I would have liked to surf, but I didn't live near the ocean. Yeah, uh, there's some stuff like that I would have liked to do that I didn't get to do. So well, I think probably early on you had a pretty good idea of who you were or the direction that you were headed and of course we know most people no, don't no. have even a, a remote sense of who they are and no, that i don't know that but anyway yeah i'm thinking about it i think i had to find myself the way everyone does right mm -hmm. and it didn't get it wasn't a gift yeah it took me a long time but it's also a process of becoming i think acceptance is the word is learning to yourself you mean Yes, accepting yourself and the life that you maybe have lived up to a certain point or accepting why things happened a certain way, how they brought you to where you're at, recognizing, you know, right. kind of this word fate and destiny, you know, and and from a standpoint spiritually that we've been talking about off and on is aligning yourself more completely 
with that agreement purpose for the future. Until but there's the also there also anomalies like uh, LSD. Right? There can be. That's another thing. <laughs> That's a total. I mean, I, I'm a bit of an expert on on that, uh, and that came along and. I mean, LSD was basically what caused the alternative, the hippie thing. I mean, yeah, it changed it changed the world, uh, changed my world forever, ever. Right. So mm -hmm. sometime we could have, uh, we could talk about that, but that's a whole huge thing. Sure. And it's very similar that. to Dharma, which you can do with Dharma, only it's uh, much more difficult to do it with drugs. Yeah. Very much more yeah. difficult. Yeah, yeah. That's a that'll be an interesting area. Okay, yeah. I, I can share with you some experiences that I've had. Sure, both bad, both bad and good. No, yep. not anywhere close to what you've been through. But uh, who knows? but uh, like I said, there's some perspective there, and some experiences I've had along the way that have been pretty much out of this world, you know, as well. Absolutely. But yeah, you know, like I said, uh, I'm feeling up to this point, feeling great, enjoying the conversation, enjoying the self-discovery. And I'm sure that there'll be people that will enjoy you revealing your history, your experiences, um, your perspective and stuff. And uh, I'm looking forward to sharing this. Do you want to move on from this? Yeah, into... no, you, you're, you're the boss. You're, you're the, you ask the questions and I'll try to, All if right. I don't know anything, I'll just say I don't know anything. So. Okay. How soon after the 60s did you know or begin Matrix? Was there a time gap there or was there something that happened? Uh, because I think I'm curious about the stages of your life and whether or not they were precipitated by certain experiences, certain uh, revelations or uh, understandings. Oh, okay, with astrology... You know, my younger brother, Stephen, was interested in astrology as I was, and he probably was more interested than I was originally, and I don't know, he may still be, for he's still programming astrology even today. Uh, so somewhere along in there, let's say that would be the late 60s, my brother Stephen opened a bookstore in Ann Arbor called Circle Books, and I did uh, posters for it. I think I also helped them redesign the whole store and put in fish tanks and uh, globe lights and make it be really kind of mystical and mysterious and wonderful. And also my wife and I, at some point we were married, uh, we did all the charts for the store. And then I also taught classes at night in the back part of the store. Uh, so somewhere I was getting into that, uh, into astrology, not just Everything, it was casual to begin with. It was like not just astrology, but numerology and the I Ching and mm -hmm. the tarot cards. I knew a little bit about all of that because I was just, you know, good GF. I went and spent, 1964, I went and spent um, that year in, at Berkeley in California. Mm -hmm. And that's where I first took acid. And uh, I worked as an as a assistant manager. I know a lot about classical music. A lot, and I was assistant manager for that for the Berkeley store called Discount Records, and I was doing a lot of stuff there. Um, when I came back to Ann Arbor from that year in Berkeley, was when uh, well, I think a lot of stuff happened. But I could let me back up. I was, we were doing the, all the charts for Circle Books, right, late 60s. But it was difficult because there were no computers. There was not even, remember, we didn't even have a four-function calculator that every one of us had until 1972. Mm -hmm. uh, so there were nothing like that. So we had to use log tables. And before that, if we wanted to do anything, look, I was trying to do, we had to use trig, trig tables. Mm -hmm. I had to use trig tables to calculate what I call the local space chart, it took me an entire day to do the mathematics to make a single chart. I started, with a, I started with a Commodore computer, and I was glad to have that after having an ephemeris 
and a book of table, uh, you know, houses yeah. or tables, you know, and having to do the mathematics, the trigonometry. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah, began well, that I, way. <laughs> well, I had the first Commodore PET 2001 uh -huh. in 1977. That's when they were, were available. That's when they first came out. And I had a, before, in 1977, I had an entire astrology program that was quite accurate. Helio, geo, local space, running in a total of 8K of RAM. Yeah. Which is really unusual. I mean, it's, right now we, we, we would spend 8K of RAM to touch a single key yeah. on the keyboard, right? So, uh, and before that, I worked with a friend of mine on mainframe computers, calculating astrology stuff. So I was trying to, I was interested in astrology. People think of me, and I've spoken about this before, as kind of like a nerdy guy or a computer guy or a math guy, it just was wrong. And, and they would say stuff to me like, Michael Earlywine, thank you very much for computerizing astrology, but now that you've done that, please leave the interpreting to us, right? We're the interpreters, you, you are a mechanic, right? And I was saying, wait a minute, math was my hardest subject. I never even got out of high school. I never graduated even from high school and I've had to teach myself almost everything I know. And I didn't get into calculating astrology stuff on a computer because I was a computer whiz. I, okay. I was, a, I'm an interpreter. I, I'm a deep, deep plunging astrology into the depths of astrology. I, that's how I saw myself. I was going where no one had ever gone. In fact, the word matrix was chosen because it's a Greek word, not for the mathematical construct of it, but for it, it just means the womb. Uh -huh. And Matrix was the womb where the future of astrology was going to be born. That was my idea. And it, and it was. So uh -huh. it actually came out of that womb. So what I'm trying to say is that my interest in computers um, came out of a desire to push the limits of astrology into areas that I wondered about. But before computers, I had no way to experiment because Nothing existed. For instance, the first book I ever wrote in 1975, this is before computers, home computers, 1975, was a book called The Sun is Shining, is the title. And it was a 400 year helio ephemeris. It was quite accurate from, mm -hmm. from I think, uh, 1600 and something or something to 2023 or something like that. I forget, 1653 maybe to 2000. And, uh, 50 or something like that. So that shows you what, a, here I was creating a tool that didn't exist so that astrologers could calculate astrologically the heliocentric chart because I was finding out that that chart wasn't just another chart. It was the mother chart of which the astrology chart that astrologers use, the geocentric, is just a view of. Mm -hmm. All these, all the standard traditional geocentric astrology, it's just a photo, just a picture of the solar system from Earth. Mm -hmm. So it's a picture. If you have, it's a, like a picture of your mother. Wouldn't you want to know a little bit about your mother if you're taking all these pictures of her? So, mm -hmm. but no, even today, they don't. Uh, they don't, they don't use. And so, so then eventually I became, oh, you're the heliocentric astrologer. When really, no, I use both of the charts. Uh -huh. And others. I use the helio, the geo, the local space, azimuth, and altitude, uh, right ascension and declination. Uh -huh. All those different coordinate systems can express the moment that we were born in slightly different view. And, and each of those systems is inclined to the other slightly different, so that we, we have different inclinations. Uh, so we're differently inclined, what moves us, what we can measure, what we appreciate. So I'm just trying to give you the picture. The picture is I wandered into doing that kind of stuff as a way of uh, better understanding, and now we can use the word, or I will, uh, understanding myself through astrology. So I always wanted to look at my, my chart. Well, what does this technique do for me? What, how, do, how do I see myself differently? Anyway, I think, that it takes, I think it takes a certain level of awareness for a person to understand particularly when they're, they're just beginning, all these multitudes of charts and techniques, what do they mean? And it took a while for me to realize that, that uh, uh, much like photographers, 
You know, all photographers don't see the same vision when they take a picture, but mm -hmm. essentially they're taking a picture of the same thing, but they are able to show it from a different angle and a different view. Exactly. Different, different charts are capable of showing us different aspects of an event or ourselves right. beyond just a, just beyond a two dimensional flat view. It's like a 3d view. Exactly. And <clears throat> that brings me to your, your uh, PDF book on deep space. Okay. And you, you even mentioned that when you were, I think, writing the forward to it, that you hadn't known of any astrologers up until that point that were daring to discuss. And that was before computers also. Yeah, that was like 1970 1976. 1976. And this is what kind of really struck me as like, you know, well, Michael either has innate, profound awareness and understanding, or he has had some experiences trigger him down through his life that have opened up this knowledge bank because you re you write with such clarity and such uh, intellectual purity, you know, it's like you talk about, about these that. things. It's like you talk about these things because you know, you know it, you don't well, have to think you, about you, it. You could ask my wife. She'd tell you I disappeared for a period of time to the university of Michigan's physics library studying mm -hmm. astrophysics and photocopying reams and reams and reams of stuff out of that library because she couldn't take the books out. Mm -hmm. And I didn't have the regular kind of cards you could do that kind of stuff because I wasn't a student or anything like that. So I had to go and study that to death, so to speak, uh, mm -hmm. before I could write that book. Mm -hmm. That book was simply a book. It was called Astrophysical Directions. It was directions for astrologers to be able to appreciate deep space in the language of astrology rather than the language of astronomy which is right ascension and de declination that idea so do you see the deep space essentially as being uh, i'll use the word which i've heard before other astrologers that that's kind of a transpersonal consciousness is what they're dealing with that it's not something that man probably is going to be able to uh in, in maybe this lifetime to um recognize as like we recognize Saturn and, you know, and, and Jupiter, and then Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto, that these things maybe are a element of human consciousness that transcends the experience of humanness to the extent we know it here. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, something like that. But again, I'm always pushing down, not pushing up which means I'm not pushing it to be more intellectual. Mm -hmm. I'm pushing to be more, to, to get our feet in the hands into the clay, right? Mm -hmm. There's a difference. There's a big I difference. Think, I, th I think what you're trying to say, Michael, is essentially uh, what I'm coming from in regards to the experience is that you're probably trying, and this is what you were looking for when you were in the blues, you were looking for that feeling, that soulful feeling of connectedness to something that you long for deep inside of yourself. And that's essentially, in my perspective, for example, is what I, in, in the interviews with the astrologers that I know, there is this intellectual fascination with technique and procedure and different types of charts and stuff like that. But I've always felt like there was something missing. There was a soulfulness. There was a soulful understanding or a transcendent conscious identity to astrology or an intelligence behind astrology. And that it was transcendent of all the things we were examining. But getting to that point was... But again, it, but again it's that I, I don't want to bicker with you. I just mm -hmm. want to say that all of you, all of the languages you use is always, and you just did it, always pushing up, looking mm -hmm. up. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm saying that's going the wrong direction. That's what okay. I'm trying to say. I'm saying what you want to do, and here's the way I explain it to myself, is that all, all language, um, all the language, like what we're doing right now, mm -hmm. we're talking, depends on the sense it makes. Right. And if it, if it doesn't make sense, we call it what? Nonsense. Right. But the word sense, sensual, senses, the five senses is, is the key here. That The point is that language 
all language can do is point at experience, the living experience of go, go and live, go and live. Just like I never finished high school because I wanted to go and live. I wanted right. to feel. So, yeah, I guess I'm complaining to a little bit that astrologers in general are all about trying to elevate, trying to get out of the body, trying to mm -hmm. get up out of the body when the truth is, unless we can get fully into our body, we have no experience to discuss. Mm. People who avoid, who prefer to live in the intellectual, conceptual world, I'm saying that's all about the sense that it makes. And then that all language is pointing to sensuality. That means, and, and you say it maybe when you say feeling, mm -hmm. uh, we need to get into the body, not out of the body. First, we need to get into the body so that we have something to talk about. Otherwise, we don't know what we're talking about. We can just talk about it. And I'm not directing this at you personally. I'm saying mm -hmm. astrologers in general live are trying to get out of the body as far as they can mm -hmm. above it. And mm -hmm. I'm just saying somebody should point out to them, that's not going to help you much because yeah. unless you get in and live, you mm -hmm. don't have anything to talk about. That's what mm -hmm. we, we talk about experience, right? We have to have, we look for people who, when I talk to all the black blues players and to all the Tibetan lamas, I was wanting to get, to, know, to, to, to feel their experience, right? Right. They were experienced. They knew what they were talking about, but I didn't know very much about what I was talking about. And certainly if, if I look at the world of astrology, uh, I'd have to say just what I said, but that, that mostly we're, we see a whole bunch of people straining to get out of the body mm -hmm. uh, without, having, without having gotten into the body first. I mean, there's a whole, there's a whole in esoteric astrology or occult ways of looking at it, esoteric astrology, I guess is a better word. This was called, you know, rounding the nadir. Reaching the body, we have to reach as far into the the visceral part of life before you start to try to get out of it. Otherwise, you're trying to leave the body before the body's ready to release you. And so, I'm very much about, uh, and I can hear it in everyone's voice and in, in everyone's reasoning, just because I can see them trying to leave the body before it's time. But that time will come when we leave the body and we leave it completely. But it's not going to come until very late in life, like the end of life. And any attempt to leave it too soon is we're just missing a lot of the reason that we have a body to begin with. I'm sorry, I don't want to preach. I'm just sort of saying. Well, that's okay. Uh, you know, I think, like I said, I think we're talking about the same thing. We just have uh, different uh, right. maybe perspective or experiences, um, you know, and, and that's interesting. You know, you have, you have considerably more earth than what I do. I have oh, one I planet, I have one planet in earth and it's in the 12th house and it's I Saturn. Like a bunch of them. <laughs> you know, yeah. That's it. <laughs> but um I think the the essence the essence, Michael, is the simple fact that we are both consciously aware that there's something there is something a part of us that is beyond most of our conscious ability to have a satisfying relationship with, and that we're looking for that. And I think what you're trying to say is, rather than trying to escape this world by going to that world, bring that world, the energy and the the power of that world, into this world, anchor it, yeah, to, make I, it to make a better world. Yeah, I'm sort of saying another way to paraphrase that would be, I, for many years I did readings to make a living, right? Mm -hmm. Almost 10 years of it. And I still do more than I have time for. Um, the whole idea of doing a reading, as I understand it, is that you people come often end up, but to, for me anyway, because they, they've given up on psychotherapy or whatever they were doing, it didn't work for them. So they end up going 
you know, shooting the moon and trying to go to a crazy astrologer and get some information, right? Uh -huh. But the point of it all is you cannot change what you refuse to accept. Mm. And unless, unless we've accepted exactly what it is for us, exactly where we're at now, even if it's painful, uh -huh. we cannot change it. It's like if I had a baseball in my hand and I, I look at my hand and I see it, gee, I'm, I'm, I'm frozen in, in the grip of that baseball, right? I have a, a death grip on it. I have to let that baseball down, flex my hands and then gently pick it back up again. That's exactly what happens in a reading that, mm -hmm. and there's lots of crying and stuff like that. People have to let go and accept what they have. So I repeat, you cannot change what you refuse to accept. If you don't accept what, where you're at, you're not going to be able to do anything at all. So I just mm -hmm. think that's an, it's just another way of saying what I'm talking about in terms of accepting your incarnation, accepting getting into the body and living in it. It's like driving a car. You can't drive the car unless you get the steering wheel, steering wheel in your hand, right? Uh -huh. And if you're just out, out, out of the body all the time, it may seem kind of transcendental, but, you know, trans, transcendental, transcending the dental, you know, my teacher used to say, snap his teeth. My, my first teacher was a Rosicrucian teacher okay. that was uh, an initiator for Rosicrucian traveling one, but he was retired. And I spent the last few years of his life. And when he died, I, I buried him and built, made a tombstone for him and all that kind of stuff. So he taught what I'm sharing now. This is basically Saturn issues, Saturn mm -hmm. cycle. If we don't incarnate, um, we have nothing to to sense. We we don't fully sense the world and experience it. We don't know what we're talking about. I think that's the way to say. It. We just we can talk about it, uh, yeah, but we don't know what we're talking about. That idea. So I keep coming back to this. I don't know why, but uh, I do. Yeah, it's a. I think it's kind of symbolically what what is what is meant by you know. Uh, having children, that that polarity, in that polarity, the opportunity exists for new birth. And without the polarity, the new birth cannot be manifested. Whether that be, you know, a, a further revelation in truth of who we are, what we are. Um, and, and then, of course, you know, the trick is balancing that, living in the world, but not being of it, to use kind of a biblical background. But not um, being of it, what's that mean? I, mean, I know the Bible thing, mm -hmm. I'm just sort of, you better be of it some. Mm -hmm. I think, I think, I, I think the intent, <clears throat> you know, I, I, sometimes I think that things like the Bible were written unconsciously or unintelligently because they weren't able to translate maybe the proper Greek or the Hebrew. Um, for me, it has to do with the fact of being able to function in the world uh, and also to work with your higher nature to be able to create or to manifest the best possible scenario for a life well lived. One in which you're able to not only, um, you know, help yourself along to exist in the physical world, but also to help people and to touch them profoundly in a way to where they realize more of who and what they are than a lot of the, you know, the self-torture that people go through, you know, from how they were raised and the, uh, the trauma that they've gone through due to lack of understanding. Um, well, yeah, I mean, my my as a Christian teacher just, you know, used to say over and over again, I mean, when I was with them, I'm a big talker. When I was with them, I never talked. Um, mm -hmm. And this would go on. Some days I was so exhausted from being with him all day long, I could barely get home <laughs> and collapse because he was pouring stuff. And he even said, I'm pouring something into you that years from now uh, you will respond to. And it's absolutely true. Uh, so I just, you know, I can't say enough how important it is uh, Yeah, to um, 
I don't know how to say it without extending the self again. Uh, I guess I just don't know how to say it right now. I'm, I'm just sort of saying we shouldn't let the opportunity of a lifetime pass. Uh, and the, the Buddhists say the same thing. They say that one of the four thoughts that turn the mind toward the Dharma is called the, the preciousness of this human life. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just saying, I guess I'm saying is that don't forget to live it. Don't forget to incarnate. And don't be so, as what I said before, so in a hurry to leave it uh, that we want to, to push ourselves out of the body because it seems more transcendental to us. Uh, when really it's just uh, ignorance on our part of uh, of the opportunity. Uh, what is it that Shakespeare said? Shakespeare, I think, is the greatest writer in the English language for me. And I haven't read them all because I got the idea of it. Uh, but he says, you are, you are no, something like, you are no more yourself than you now here live. Mm -hmm. We're just as much, only as much as we care to actually live. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm talking about getting our hand, hands in the clay of ourselves, get, get, getting incarnate, not being afraid of being incarnate, not being afraid of the senses, um, but plunging ourselves in the senses so that we will feel of life. And I sound, I sound like a preacher, and maybe I'm a modern kind of preacher, but... Um, Something like that. That's what you feel. That's what you feel. That's what yeah. you feel authentically what's inside of yourself. And, and if you're a true person, you're going to say what you feel. Okay? Well, exactly. Because yeah. you, you feel that uh, self-empowerment. Now, we've been doing this for almost an hour, Michael. Yeah, and I'm, just wondering, I'm just wondering, do you want to stop right here? and then I, I don't need to if you don't need to. I mean, you, you can always chop this up however you want. As, as, as long as you have any questions, I can talk for a while. At some point, mm -hmm. I need to stop, but uh, okay. I'm a big talker, as I just said. I, um, just think that, I just think that there is probably a lot that you and I could communicate and right. talk about. Uh, and I've got some other things that I need to do, cool. but I wanted to ask, you know, how you felt about our interview, and if you would like to continue and do more of this, because I've still got uh, questions on Buddhism. I have questions on experiences, uh, LSD and otherwise. All right. Uh, your writing, okay, and then yeah, also the also the heart center and where that came in, and and it maybe even uh, as important as everything, your relationship with Margaret and what that has taught you about. Uh, yourself, your life, your growth. Of course. How, you, how you've seen that relationship teach you, how she has been your teacher and helped uh, you to recognize maybe the flaws in your character or your being and the growth you had to go through in that relationship, if you're open to that. Oh, yeah. I mean, we've been married for 50 years. Got, you know, four kids and eight grandkids. So I know all about that kind of stuff because. Okay. We, we're doing a lot of babysitting. Okay. Uh, like I said, this, is a, this uh, like I said, this, I, I, I feel good about this. I feel good about the energy. I feel good about the discussion. Cool. I feel that it's valuable information for other people, uh, you know, and that they'll get a different understanding of and astrology. So, so you'll give me a copy of what we've done here. I'll give you a copy for this, and, and then we'll set something up. I'll do an electional chart and stuff because it and, seemed and, to work pretty good for us today. And when are you going to publish what you do? I mean, I'm free to do what I want with what you send me. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I just may any... chop, it, chop it up and put it up. And when you publish yours, let me know. I'll put it on my site. I reach a fair number of people. Okay. Sounds good to me. Like I said, I won't do a whole lot of editing to it. I'll, I'll dress it up. Do whatever uh, you want. Okay. I'll dress it, I'll dress it up uh, and, and, and let the, let the content and the energy, you know, uh, um, touch whoever it touches. Good. So I'm available whenever you want to do another one. Just let me know. And uh, okay, okay, Certainly. we good. That sounds good to me. Like I said, I'll do a I'll do a chart. Maybe we'll schedule it off of that. All right. So okay. we'll say 
Peace. See you soon. All yes. right. Thank you, Michael. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye now.